My name is uh, Harald Tidriber, uh, and I'm a mechanical engineering student from Norway. It is my pleasure to introduce Han Juan. Han holds a BS and MS in, in the industrial engineering and operations research. Here's from Berkeley. Go Bears. Han was also the second student ever at UC Berkeley to win a teaching award from a different department than his own. Since graduating in 1999, Han has, uh, has been the leader of engineering teams at eBay and helped to grow uh, eBay's mobile business from 200 million to $2 billion. In the same span, he helped to grow the engineering team from just himself to over 80 different people. He's led teams that launched native um, Netflix apps on iOS, Android, and Apple TV. He's built a social media platform and sold it, and he also holds five patents. Currently, he is the senior vice president at Upwork, the world's largest labor marketplace. Upwork is a platform for freelancers and employers to meet. This is a job where Han gets to bring a social impact by enabling people to do meaningful work. And when researching Han, he struck me as a very disciplined person. And yesterday, on the phone with him, I had to ask him if that was correct. He told me most people would consider him disciplined. He wakes up at four most days, he journals a lot, he reads, and he meditates. What surprised me, however, is that he would not describe himself as hardworking. After trying to work hard for years, Han had a pretty serious incident. And after walking away without, without any serious injury, he realized that everything he worried about uh, did not matter. Uh, he started taking classes he actually cared for. And in Han's own words, I stopped being stressed about doing well and instead started just to appreciate the journey. After he focused on efficiency instead of hard work, his salary and life quality went up exponentially, which is why he puts a hard cap on 50 to 55 hours of work a week. I'm very excited to hear more about what Han has to tell us, and without further ado, here's Han Juan. So we, you are our third speaker. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I don't know if you all noticed, but we keep getting younger and younger and younger. So you've been the youngest speaker so far. Really? Yeah. yeah who've been the other ones? Uh, well, Charlie Giancarlo and Mary Lou Jepsen. And so, you know, by just a couple of years, but, uh, but still. But with everybody, we've asked people to start to talk about their journey and a little bit about inflection points. And so that's why, just as a basis for comparison, I'm wondering if you can kind of share a little bit about your formative years and focus a little bit on Cal because you've been in everybody's seats. So, um, so I was at Cal for about six years. Um, I spent two years doing my master's and, oh, sorry. I spent a year and a half uh, getting my MS and four and a half getting my, my bachelor's. Um, I, I think in hindsight, my years at Cal were probably some of the best years of my life. Um, it wasn't always easy. Um, the story that uh, Harold um, referred to um, was that uh, I, nearly got kicked out of school, uh, I would say almost twice. Um, first, as an undergraduate, um, I, I really, really struggled my first year. And uh, I, I don't know if this is still the case, but um, back when I was in school, if you could not get your GPA above 2.0 by the time you were a junior, you, you would get kicked out. And so the, the dean would have this, I thought it was like a joke, but when we actually went to orientation, the, the dean of engineering would actually have us all in a room and say, if you look to your left, look to your right, one of you, know, one of you won't be here. And it, it really was uh, true at the time. And so... Does that still happen? No. At the time, I thought it was a joke, and then I saw it. So <laughs> it was pretty, pretty strange. Um, but... Uh, I, I really struggled in school. I was, I was working really, really hard. Uh, I almost get kicked out. Um, and I was on the way to getting kicked out. But what happened was uh, the summer that I, um, the, the summer of my first year, I, I get into this major car accident. And for me, it was this epiphanic moment that um, in, in, the, in the process of having that accident, I, I did the whole like life slowing down thing. And um, it occurred to me that uh, if I'm going to get kicked out anyway, I should really just focus on what, what I wanted to do. And so um, having survived the accident, I, I came back um, really only showing up to classes that I cared about. Um, I also uh, did something a little bit unusual, which was I, I went up to um, 
a lecturer at the time. His name is uh, uh, Mike Clancy. And uh, Professor Clancy um, was running a self-paced center, and he allowed me to um, TA some of his classes in computer science because I, I was using CS classes to code. And so, uh, or I was using CS classes to boost my GPA. Um, <laughs> And uh, by, by actually sort of giving back to the community, it, it, it did two things. One, it, it, helped boost my it helped boost my confidence, but it also um, gave me, um, it allowed me to just really enjoy the journey. And uh, what ended up happening was the ensuing years, my academic performance went up. Um, I found all this joy um, teaching classes. Uh, and. Uh, by the time the 90s hit, um, I really, really didn't want to leave school. And so that's how, that's how I ended up in graduate school. So interestingly enough, you were also the third speaker who went to graduate school. Is it, was it because you just enjoyed the journey? Or what are the classes that you liked so much? I think I was too scared to go into the real world. Um, it was a lot more fun to be in school. Uh, I really, really enjoyed teaching. Um, I felt like I was making a difference. I felt like my work mattered. Um, and so even though so many of my friends were um, joining these like obscure companies like eBay, Yahoo, uh, and were They becoming, were obscure then. Yeah, they were. Um, and they, they were becoming like paper millionaires. I, I found myself perfectly content to make $12 an hour um, teaching, teaching CS classes here. Um, one of the things, you seem like you were like super studious, and, and I wanted to ask you about that, but listening to you that you were a TA, I'm curious from a TA's perspective, what do you look for in students? What do you remember thinking, like how could you inspire students as a TA? I found that the biggest trick was just to get them to be interested in the material itself. Um, and if you could get students to understand um, to be able to get some traction on the material um, to, and to make it accessible. Um, most of the time, um, students can, can pick it up themselves. If you can't build the interest, then you're, you're, you're probably not going to get um, a, a good result. Like the student's just not going to be engaged or they're, they're just not interested in the material. And, and computer science is one of those things where um, it, is, it is very, very hard work. It, it requires a ton of keyboard time. And so the best thing that you can do um, as an instructor is to really get people to be engaged in the material itself. So I'm fascinated how you say that, because in a weird way, it sounds like you're marketing computer science or marketing whatever you were teaching. So I'm just curious how that might have impacted as you started thinking about possibly like letting go and going to school, I mean, going to school, going into the workforce. How did that transition work for you? How did you decide to not get your PhD? Um, I had this very curious thing where uh, I, I really loved school, um, but the day that I started graduate school, I went on to campus and um, I realized that it was the same old campus and the students were still the same, um, but they weren't the students that I knew. And I could see these um, individuals that reminded me of people that I used to know, but they were not the same people. And, it was a sort of like very isolating moment, so to speak, where I didn't want to go into the real world, mm -hmm. but the world had effectively slowly passed me by. And uh, while I knew some younger folks um, at you know, lower levels, um, the, my, my, my social circle had moved on. Well, I'm just curious, what did you do your graduate work in? What was your thesis on? I have no idea. I like it. <laughs> I totally do not remember. That's, that's fine. That wasn't one of our questions, just curious. So when you graduated, it was 1999. And some, we, we've alluded to what 1999 was, besides a song. Can you talk about a little bit how it felt to be graduating at that time? I, I would say, um, you know, clearly folks here have probably not seen 1999, but uh, 1999 is a lot like 2019. Um, you had a lot of companies uh, that were going public. Um, they, some of them had questionable business models. They did not have a clear path to profitability. Um, 
there were uh, many people who were graduating from school um, and becoming quite wealthy very quickly, at least on paper. Um, the job market was booming. Uh, folks were graduating um, even in the 90s um, with six-figure salaries uh, with zero work experience. Um, and it, it, it was one of those times where it, it just felt like it was all about to crash soon. Did you feel that way? I did, yeah. So how did that impact what decision you made when you're graduating? I didn't have a choice um, to, to, to go into anything but software at the time. Um, because I was an operations research uh, major, I really wanted to get into management consulting, which was sort of like the thing at the time. That was sexy then. Yeah, that was sexy like then. Like McKinsey, BCG. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and my idea was that if I could be a management consultant, I could experience all these um, you know, really difficult business problems at scale, and then hopefully get inspired to uh, build my own company one day. And so that was my sort of envisioned path to entrepreneurship. But the, uh, the big consulting firms only recruited in the spring. And so uh, as a result, um, because I chose to take one, one extra class in the summer and teach at Berkeley, um, I had no, no choice but to actually look for work in September, which is a pretty uncommon time for companies to recruit. So how, do you remember what you, so I actually did a little chart. So Han, and maybe you got this from listening to Harold, has worked all over the place. And I, I just didn't have enough space. But I thought it might be interesting to see some of the different things that you've done. I hope you can see that with the, the challenge of the light in the classroom. But so notice how big I have Cal there. And then you went to, I think you pronounce it SABA software, S-A-B-A. That was, that's who would take you? Is that how it went? Yeah, so I, I was at this career fair. Um, the, the founder and the head of engineering were at the career fair and they, um, they were actually working the table. And um, I just walked up to them and said, hey, I, I need a job. I only have 500 bucks to my name, so <laughs> I'm okay, willing Han, to code. <laughs> everybody really listens very carefully. So is that what you said? Which is fine. I like the honesty. It was, like, yeah. Um, and uh, we, we actually started a talk shop right at the table. Um, and I asked uh, the, uh, the founder or the co-founder um, about you know why why they were using Java at the time um, yeah. and a very specific Java had had memory leaks um, and it was at that point that we we got into a pretty deep discourse and from there um, he invited me over to uh, do a round of interviews but I was probably one of the uh, very few uh, college graduates that they had hired in, in part because. Um, they were, we were all, they were recruiting off cycle, but companies were so desperate at the time to hire that um, it was possible to get a job completely off cycle. Sounds like you were able to create a conversation also uh, in something that you were particularly good at, which was coding and, and software and talk to the co-founder about that. Yeah. So that was kind of clever. You might not know that, but I thought that was pretty clever. Um, so in terms of industry experience and starting out, um, you've had a quite a diverse career. This is just probably half of the companies you've worked at. Um, you've worked at smaller companies. You've done your own startup. We can see eBay up there, Netflix. I am kind of curious. Um, you do seem very planful in how you do things, but at the same time willing to let it go. How, how did you start, why did you start to, uh, to, why did you leave Sabo? What are some things that kind of led you to your career switches and starting your own companies? I think we see one up here or two, but you've started more. I, I, I wanna give folks a, a bit of a caveat. Um, some of these stories might, might seem scary, um, but I think in, in hindsight, it is, it is sort of the way of how, um, you know, my journey happened to go through the corporation and, and some of these things just, they happen. Um, and at, at Saba, I, I would say that's really the, the first chapter of my career. Um, one of the things that I've been very, uh, I, I would say fortunate is that uh, I happen to uh, work with a very, very strong managers, uh, in some cases unusually strong managers, and I think that ha has probably had an outsized impact 
on uh, my career um, because I was able to learn things that, uh, from, from somebody that, that could teach me. Um, is, and is there something that you look for, I mean, to see if that manager will be helpful for you? What makes a strong manager? How would you look for that? I think when I was in my 20s, I had no idea that this was a thing. Um, I just happened to fall into it. So I can't take any credit for the good fortune that I had at Saba. Um, but uh, at other companies, it, uh, it had a lot to do with um, how connected they were, uh, what did they accomplish professionally, um, who else they hired, um, and how well did they hire, were they able to attract talent, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so can you take us, so one company that's kind of interesting to me is when you started um, kind of right up after Saba, you, um, shortly after you started your own company. Can you talk about going from Saba, which you seem to love, and working with that manager, why you decided to leave? Um, my, my journey at Saba was somewhat complex because I, I ended up having multiple managers. Um, four of them were extraordinary. Um, but as, as the 90s bled into the early 2000s, um, like many companies, we went through many rounds of brutal layoffs and you, you started to see um, your friends losing their jobs. Um, and by, by 2003, um, it, was, it was a really awkward place where uh, ultimately my team was, was being asked to laid up, be laid off and I, I was basically offered to uh, take on a team uh, in India of about 70 people. And, you know, I was youngish, right, like 26, 27. Um, but then uh, lay off uh, the 12 people that were here. And I decided uh, for my part that um, I didn't want to be a part of that. And so in 2003, uh, at the highest point of unemployment, I had just uh, put down a down payment for a townhome. Um, I was unemployed. Did you, so it's interesting, um, many people in the room will probably be asked to lay people off. It's the yuckiest thing to do as manager, if, if you want to be a manager. Um, so you just didn't? You I just didn't do it. Um, I didn't think it was right, and so I stood by that. Um, I ended up joining a much smaller company of about 15, 25 people. Um, again, I was very fortunate. The uh, CEO at the time ended up eventually becoming the chief operating officer of Kleiner Perkins. Um, there was a senior software engineer at the company. I thought he was okay. Um, turned out he was actually more than okay. His name is Jay Krebs. He ended up founding Kafka, um, which is uh, now Confluent. Um, the founder of the company was Steve Yankovich. He became an EIR at eBay. I worked with him there. Um, we uh, made a pretty significant impact on eBay Mobile. So did he pull you over to eBay? He did employ me over at eBay. How does that work? Um, that, that brings you to the buddy stumbler thing, uh -huh. because at this very tall, small company that seemingly went nowhere, um, I happened to be around some extraordinary individuals. Um, the company ended up getting sold, but in the middle I had uh, built a social network. Um, I grew the network from you know, like zero people to about 10,000 users. And at some point, uh, somebody approached me and wanted to buy it for $250,000, which at the time I thought, wow, this is an extraordinary amount of money. But what was really extraordinary about the experience was that up until that point, I was only um, building enterprise software, which had relatively few users because it was at corporate scale. Um, the opportunity to build something at internet scale and actually watching people use the software uh, was extremely eye-opening and what was really neat was people joined my social network and several of them um, met each other and, and actually got married and so um, it was the first time where I, I realized I could I could write software um, and instead of like solving boring corporate problems I could you know potentially make an impact on people's lives in a, in a pretty meaningful way. What did Buddy Stumbler become? What was the software used for? Do you know? So this company bought it, and then they turned it into a porn site. <laughs> they didn't tell me about that. What, what was so, it called then? I, I don't, Just curious. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, 
because it, it, they, they changed the names, they just took it away, so, they would just bought it for the traffic. And so I, I was extremely so bummed. So when you sell a company, can, do you have any control? No, you just I, don't know. Do you think that now, could you, like from that experience, would you put anything in place to, um, so that that wouldn't happen, or is that that's just how it goes? I would have to try again. Like next time I'm in that position, I'll let you know. No, no porn. No, no, no porn. No porn sites. Don't yeah, use myself your, for porn. Two-year plan that doesn't involve porn. So then, how did that work? Um, so that you went to, to, toward eBay. So you sold. The, I assume you sold for two fifty for whatever it was. Right. So I thought Order I was rich. Order of a million dollars. Right. I, I thought I was rich at this time. It's 2007. You know, things are going up again. Um, uh, I was able to get a couple of introductions uh, to, to VCs, um, and at the time, funding was pretty good. You could get funded for half a million, a million dollars. It felt very easy to raise, it felt like an easy process to raise money. And I was convinced that um, I could do this all alone. Um, and so uh, I, I started building this, um, this uh, site. Um, at first with some friends, but then they kind of abandoned me, and, but I, I was determined, and I, I had the money to sort of ride it out. Um, I kept a lot of the money in the stock market at the time, um, but as I kept building this thing, it just never seemed good enough, and I never shipped the product, and I, I think that's something that entrepreneurs really need to be careful about, that eventually you, you need to ship product, and you need to get product market fit. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that at the time. Um, and as we moved into 2008, um, and because I was so heavily leveraged in the stock market, um, I, w I watched uh, all of my net worth come crashing down um, in the big crash. Um, I mean, it really came crashing down. Sorry yeah. that I'm just saying that like that, but that's pretty frightening. So at the same time where you're watching anything that's kind of um, supporting the company that you're creating, um, which is from the stock market, you feel like you're not getting leverage with your company? No. And, and I was also doing somewhat, at the time, um, since I was bootstrapping, um, Can you um, just say real quick what bootstrapping means, just so everybody knows? Bootstrapping refers to the process of using your own funds to start your own company. Um, but because I was so heavily leveraged in the stock market, um, in, in some cases uh, we had like margin calls and things like that. I, I basically saw everything plummet um, to really, really low levels. Um, I, I chose to stay out in the field for a while, in part because um, despite the fact that I had done other things. Um, when the market crashed and you were just this unemployed person like randomly writing code in a coffee shop, um, it was remarkable to me that uh, even people that I knew, um, people that I thought I, w I was close to, they, they had written me off. Um, they had not. They had. Oh, they had. Oh, sorry. Um, but a few people of influence, uh, one of them uh, happened to be Steve. Um, eventually uh, called me up and uh, said, hey, I, I joined eBay. It, he did two things. One was um, I did get a job at some point through a connection, um, and it was in enterprise software. And I, since I had made a vow to myself that I would never go into enterprise software, I, I actually turned down that job, and I was down to my last $5,000. Um, I uh, decided that I was going to take one last crack um, and try to like keep the lights on, and so I started day trading the five thousand um, dollars, and eventually turned it into fifty thousand dollars while I continued to build my site. Um, um, just, just a side question for anybody who's considering day trading: Did you have an algorithm? How, how were you so successful at that? That wasn't your sweet spot from coding. It wasn't, but um, during my Berkeley years, um, I happened to do a ton of uh, work around portfolio optimization. Um, this was before uh, high-speed trading uh, came into play. And so um, I, I wrote my own little piece of code to do risk-adjusted trading. Um, Interesting. That, that did help. Um, it was pretty much imperfect, but it helped give me a view on, on what I should trade. Um, but the, the Yankovic story comes into play when um, eventually, he comes to me and says, hey, look, I'm, I'm at eBay. Um, it is a big consumer brand. You're going to be able to get to build uh, internet-scale software. Um, 
I know you're building your own junky little thing on the side. It's not going to go anywhere, so why don't you come join me? We'll go build some things uh, on the side here at eBay. And, and it will probably not go anywhere either, but at least you'll get paid. And at that point, I, I thought, hey, I was successful briefly. I tried again and failed. Um, maybe it's time to see how this big company thing works. How did the big company thing work? How'd you, how did it feel to be there? What were, like, what were some of the differences? I, I've never worked at eBay. I don't know that anybody else here has. Just curious, how did it feel after um, being in your townhome that I guess you owned and day trading then going into eBay? Um, it was interesting at the time because when, when, you, when you come from a position where you, you have almost nothing left, um, your motivations are very, very different. And, um, what I saw at this company was um, enormous scale that I could not wrap my head around. Um, and the, the marketplace itself was quite extraordinary because people, people actually make a living off of the marketplace. Um, and so I, I came in with a, a ton of ambition um, and just a lot of energy to be able to build something extraordinarily neat. Did you have a team immediately of people who are working with you? Or working for you, even? No, because up until that point, I had a, a number of experiences um, in management that I found particularly challenging. Um, the, the fact that you're really responsible for how people grow their careers, um, the fact that you might be asked to terminate them, those are things that I, I felt were a heavy burden. And so um, in almost all of my job changes up until that point, um, I had asked not to be put into management. And each and every time, I somehow had to start managing people again. So when I joined eBay, uh, the specific request was, let me write some code. Um, don't make me manage anybody. So what's interesting about that is before when we had talked, um, Han has gotten uh, not only recognition, official recognition from Cal as grad instructor, um, you also were talking about the speech that you had given when you were leaving that was so moving, and you talked about your popularity. There's something about an instructor that has to be motivating, and there's something about a manager that has to be motivating. It seems like something that came really naturally, but you didn't want it to do it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard work. It is hard work. So, but you were at eBay for a while. Can you, did, did things change or did you, were you allowed to be an individual contributor? It, it, it changed because of one thing. So, um, and I think this is, this is one of the important lessons that I, I learned uh, at the time. Um, a lot of times, uh, being at the right place at the right time is really important, but you, you really need to know, you, you have to be able to look around and, and find the like identify the opportunity at the right moment. And um, while we were looking at uh, potential business opportunities for eBay, um, one of the things that came about was um, at some point eBay decided that the, the mobile effort was not, not part of the company's turnaround. Um, this was, you know, two years after Steve Jobs announced uh, the iPhone. It was an extraordinary device. Um, many of us felt like it would change the world. Um, it struck many people as making no sense. Like, why would you make such a huge purchase on your phone without doing more research, uh, without, without using a desktop? Um, but we felt at the time that there was an extraordinary opportunity there. And so uh, when we pitched to um, have some of that the, those uh, digital assets, uh, those systems moved over our group. Um, it was essentially just me, a uh, business development person, and my manager um, running this. And so uh, we, we had to find help, uh, hire engineers, work with consultants, and, and build this thing up. How big was that business? It went from a, a couple hundred million dollars, and then in 22 months, it, it pushed close to $3 billion in volume. $3 billion. Yeah. We would have side outages where we would be losing like $100 a minute. Um, it was pretty, pretty extraordinary. And, but yet, at some point, you left eBay and then went to Netflix for a year. It was. I, I think um, one of the things that I learned at the time, and this is, I think is also important, is that the, um, you should always run run towards an opportunity and not run away from a problem. Um, and for me, I think, the 
lack of desire to run large teams uh, was really, really prevalent. And as that, that team grew larger and larger, um, and as the sort of large company thing, it mm -hmm. just didn't really suit me. Um, I, I was really having a hard time getting used to it. Um, I, I ended up uh, effectively defecting. Um, yeah. And it was, it was probably the uh, one and only time where I uh, accepted a job and then quit a job. And every other time since, I've always quit Gotten first. off the train? I've always gotten off the train and become unemployed voluntarily. Um, but Netflix was an extraordinary opportunity. Um, Again, it was somewhat early days. Uh, I was, um, a couple of months prior to my hiring, um, my, my supervisor, his name was Greg Peters, he currently is the chief product officer, um, had written a blog post about how uh, Netflix was um, going to, that Android did not have the ability to perform secure playback, um, that uh, Netflix intended to fork the operating system itself and, and work with TV manufacturers directly. And so I was hired um, to run that engineering team. Interesting. Um, in the interview process. Uh, uh, wait, hold on. You were hired to run the team? And how big was that team? It was like three people. Oh, so that felt more comfortable. OK, just, just <laughs> was wondering. It was, it was really a ground zero effort. Um, I, in the interview process, I had my infinite level of ambition. I said, hey, like, I know, I know you have this iOS thing. Like, I, I really think mobile is going somewhere. Can I, can I have the iOS program itself, too? And um, at the time, uh, the, the belief in mobile, uh, even at Netflix, was, was, was I think, a heavy debate. Again, again, like, why would anybody watch full feature length movies on your phone? It, it was something that people really struggled uh, wrapping their heads around. And so um, one of the things that I, I wanted to do was uh, really take what I learned uh, at eBay and, and see if um, I could be a part of something revolutionary, that people would, would get to watch movies, um, full-length movies, uh, on their phone. Why do you think that you had this passion for that when other people were like, mm, not so sure? What did you see that other people didn't see? Um, I wasn't sure if it would work, yeah. but I happen to like gadgets a lot, and so I just thought the phone was the coolest thing. Um, and, and the idea of having the internet in your pocket was such, a, such an incredible, incredible yeah. idea. So one of the things that, um, let's see if I can get this back up. Um, I know we're, I just want to make sure we have enough time for questions at the end. So I know I'm kind of hopping around a little bit. I know that you went back to um, eBay after you were at Netflix for a while. And you've also had a business that you've been running the whole time. But just so we have enough time, I think it's interesting that you uh, want to do something that is great for everybody. That's what you said about Netflix and making sure that everybody could see it. Um, it seems to be kind of integral into the company where you are now, where you're actually VP of engineering, where I do think that you might have a larger team under you. So I'm just wondering how it came about that you went to Upwork. And, and if you don't mind, why is everybody called WeWork? Or like, do you get confused? Or there's so many similar sounding companies now. I'm wondering if, if you can answer both at the same time. So um, for those of you who don't know, Upwork is the, um, was the merger of a, a company called Elance and another company called Odesk. Um, it is uh, the world's largest marketplace for remote work. Um, we do about $2 billion in volume about 1.7 million hours of work are transacted uh, on the platform uh, per week. Um, and another way to think about it is there are people who really want, they, they have the skills, they have a college degree, and they can do work. And we have people who have work, and the work is being done, and then money is being transferred from one person to another. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting uh, company to work for because it's very, very rare for, I, I would argue, any of us to have a chance to be able to work at a company where other people are also, uh, also making money. So from, from your work before, it seemed like you had these eight big lessons uh, that you kind of bring into your work at Upwork. Do you mind, do you, do you, do you remember what those are? 
um, oh. as you were thinking about w the experience that you take from all of from your journey from Cal all the way to Upwork. At, at least, um, you know, one of the questions you asked uh, was why why did I end up taking or pursuing the job at Upwork? Um, sometimes things happen uh, in your life that are somewhat out of your control, um, and at some point. Um, there were activist investors uh, that were calling for the split of uh, eBay and PayPal. Um, and in the middle of that, uh, I, I was ultimately um, asked to fire my entire team. And uh, despite being, uh, despite requesting that I be put on the layoff list, um, and then I, I was assigned a different job. And I think that that really bothered me because um, I didn't feel like I had a seat at the table I didn't have uh, full control over what would happen to uh, my life or the people that I managed. Um, and so, you know, going back to my narrative around running away from problems versus towards opportunities, I realized that uh, for the longest time I had always sort of dodged um, more management responsibility. Um, I would decide to face that uh, this time by um, taking on a head of engineering role, um, manage a lot more people. Um, and take that head on. That's incredible. Some of the things that you had said, which I thought were really interesting, um, that you really thought it was important to learn the craft, crave people to use your work, like you just said, instead uh, running, <laughs> running away from problems but toward an opportunity, craving work that matters, choosing your manager and then factor in the company and the opportunity. Um, hard work is for losers. Can you talk more about that? This is more of a sidebar, but it did have um, a big impact on me. Um, for the first couple of years when I started work, I worked extremely hard because my view was that um, even though I felt like I wasn't as smart as um, everybody else that I was working with, and I, I had certainly been humbled multiple times at Berkeley where it felt like everybody was always smarter than me, I always felt like I could out-hustle them. And so I, I would work extremely long hours. Um, I ended up um, working anywhere from 130 to 140 hours. I would sleep under the desk at work. Um, and some of the work that I was doing at the time appeared to be very crucial uh, to the company's IPO. Um, but what I really, what I started to realize that was that my health was, um, I was taking a huge toll on my own personal health. Um, and that while I was working very hard, I wasn't figuring out, um, I, I wasn't, really moving anywhere, and I wasn't necessarily happy. Um, and so it occurred to me at some point that um, no matter how, how long I worked, um, everything is somewhat finite, that like, eventually I am going to die. Um, eventually my career is going to end, and, and there, there is a, a clock at the end of it. And so um, I was basically trading um, I was, I was trading time and hoping to earn money uh, from it, um, perhaps inefficiently because the money, I'm salaried, right? So the money is finite. Um, and so it occurred to me that I really need to think about it in a different way, which was, is there a way to, for me to get a higher rate of return on my time? And so instead of thinking about working harder, I started thinking about how do I work more efficiently? And in order to create that constraint, um, I, I put an artificial cap on myself to only work uh, at first uh, no more than 80 hours, and then eventually uh, today I, I, you I mean cap myself in a week. In a week, um, to you know 40, 45 hours. Um, and I think as, as a result of it, you you become. I, I found that uh, over a period of time, um, it has helped me. It's like it's like investing um, in a bank account where your your compounding interest is at a much higher rate. Um, by focusing on um, how you use your time um, and, and really managing your time like an accountant um, and being very mindful of uh, what you're doing and what kind of impact you intend to make, um, a lot of times it's not, it's not about working harder. Um, it's, it's really about working much smarter. Uh, there's something else that I thought was kind of smart that you had um, mentioned in terms of a lesson, and that was plan to leave the day you arrive. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think the, the biggest um, career successes that I've had uh, in, in my career, uh, I've, 
I've always had this, um, when I start the job, I'll ask myself, what, what is it that I would like to see as an outcome? And I think, I think the world is uh, remarkably self-fulfilling that way. Um, when I joined Netflix, um, despite the naysayers, um, I, I really wanted to see, um, I wanted to make sure that Netflix was a core part of, um, or that the apps were a core part of Netflix's strategy. Um, I, I felt like they needed to have a very strong tablet presence. Um, and uh, for me, uh, much of the success was going to be measured uh, in terms of consumption of, uh, yeah. the, of, of mobile bandwidth. Um, by the time we left, uh, by the time I left, um, you know, I'm a little bit uncomfortable mentioning some of these numbers because it is going to be on the internet, but we, we had a significant number, a very, very high number of um, active users uh, at Netflix had streamed on a mobile device in a week. Um, and uh, the amount of pressure that we were, that one company was actually putting on, on the carrier networks themselves, in, in a, the 3G carrier networks was significant enough that we, we would get calls um, when we had bugs in our software. Uh, from the mobile carriers themselves. And so um, while I was not there for very long, um, I, I felt like um, I had fulfilled the, the legacy that I had set out to build. And I think that's really important because if you, if you plan your career moves around what you're going to ultimately put on your LinkedIn, um, that, that becomes its own story and that, that allows you to be um, the hero of your own story, so to speak, and that that's something that you can mindfully craft every time you you start and stop a job. So, interestingly, at Upwork, you're obviously in charge of an engineering team, but the the essence of that company is you're hiring people to work. Um, what I think would be interesting, because a lot of students are working on interviewing and trying to get jobs, knowing what you know with your background, how do you hire people? For either working with you at Upwork, or what do you look like? What do you look for for freelancers? I would say in general, I've I probably interviewed several hundred people, um, and I've hired hundreds. Um, I, I would say, unfortunately or fortunately, um, you know, probably three, four dozen people have been terminated on my watch. Um, when I hire people, and I, I actually have an article on the internet about this, I only look for three for three very specific qualities. One is um, somebody who has the habit of deliberate practice, who um, really thinks about when they, they have this, this quirk where they can't let something go, and they, they really uh, methodically practice whatever they're passionate about. Um, somebody who um, is really, really self-aware. Um, the the self-awareness is really important because if you know what you know and you know what you don't know, then you're more likely to be able to focus on what you don't know and get better at it. Um, and so it's very common for me to interview somebody and ask them a question uh, on something they ostensibly do not know very well, as well as something they claim to know very well. Can you give an example? Um, you well, had a conversation with Harold. Sorry, I'll just put Harold on the spot for a second. Um, what would you ask him about that he knows that since he's uh, a master's of engineering studying uh, mechanical engineering? I never studied mechanical engineering, so I'm not quite sure if I can ask him a question. Um, How about something he wouldn't know? If there's a CS uh, major here, I can ask them that question. Who, who wants to volunteer to be the CS major? Right over there. Oh, okay, great. What's a programming language you, you know very well? So Python. Python. Um, so is Python a duct type language? Is Python a duct type language? There you go. And so much for that job. <laughs> How, do you know what that means? No. I don't either. But I'm not a CS major. What about something? What about something that um, something else that um, this very brave student might not know? Well, this is instructive, right? Because um, it the the level of self awareness it, it it instantly shows a gap, and it's it's very very fast and it's very powerful. Um, the converse is asking some somebody a question of what they think they don't know very well. You, you start to probe uh, an individual's level of confidence and, and awareness the other way. Um, and, and then I think the final thing that I, I wanted to add was just 
um, uh, really testing people's grit. And so the, the most common approach that I use is um, I, I don't actually believe in verbal interviews a whole lot when it comes to um, assessing uh, software engineers. Software engineers, they, they crack, their work is um, in front of a machine uh, with a keyboard and an IDE. My preferred way of testing um, software engineers is to give them a hard line, give them a machine configured exactly the way they want, give them three hours of time, feed them, tell them this is an impossible problem and uh, just lock them up and have them go at it. And the, the really cool thing is um, when you come back, you can always tell uh, who's, who's going to be incredible. The, the, the person that gets the job is um, so excited to show you what they wrote, despite the fact that they didn't get it done. They're t they realize that they probably didn't get the job. Um, and in many, many cases, um, and, like, I'm basically telling you how to hack my interview, but. That's exactly what we're asking. <laughs> they take the work, um, thinking that they didn't get the job, and they finish it anyway, and they send you the answer. Uh, I, I have to say one thing. I really appreciate that you didn't know something, and I, I think that people's tendency is to want to pretend like they know something they don't know, and I just want to say that there is some power in saying, I don't know, but, but. This is how I'd maybe find out. So I just want to add that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important that you don't, you don't fake interviews. Um, so I, I imagine that there are a ton of questions. I have a few questions. William, if you're out there, I know I have your question to, to talk about. I actually wanted to ask you something on diversity. But we're at 7.30, and so I really wanted to open it up. Um, and I think I have a student volunteer. Thank you very much. Um, to help uh, pass around the microphone. And just like normal, if you have a question, say what you're studying and ask Khan. And on that note, while you're, th are, you, are you ready or shall I? I'm gonna ask William's question. Is William ready to ask the question himself or does he want me to ask it? Okay, William. Um, I, William has an interesting question, uh, and I hope I say it right, so you just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the question has to do with what you're doing right now with Upwork. Um, a number of platforms have had some issues because the users feel like the platforms have been changed without any of their input. Can you talk a little bit about what happens at Upwork? Because there's so many users who are using the platform. I'm sure there are changes, but do you incorporate the user? Do you not incorporate the user? Is that uh, helpful, William? Um, excuse me. Um, we, we definitely in incorporate the user. We have um, user forums that we, we have uh, full-time employees uh, monitoring all the time. We also um, obviously monitor Twitter, Reddit, uh, so on and so forth. Um, all those inputs come into the system. Um, and it allows us to uh, make product decisions. But ultimately, they, they really are um, only one input. Um, when you have internet scale software um, with the appropriate um, you know, click path tracking, you get a real sense of uh, how people use things. Um, and with the ability to be able to test um, hypotheses um, and, and really use a more data-driven way of product development, um, sometimes what you build isn't exactly what the customers are asking for, but hopefully you're building things that are solving the problems uh, that the customers want, want solved. And so there, there is that disconnect. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so out of all the times you talk to venture capitalists, um, pitching them your ideas, what are some examples of like pushback that you've received from those investors, and then how did you respond to that? You know, the funny thing is they will rarely push back. Um, they might give you some advice, uh, but ultimately uh, when they're talking to you, they are uh, very much so uh, assessing you. Um, and perhaps more so assessing you and less your business idea. Um, I think if you come in with something, uh, with an idea or a project that already has product market fit um, and has a high growth curve, then to, to some degree um, it sells itself. Um, 
But if you are coming in with like just a stone cold idea, a lot of it is going to come down to track record, uh, who you know, um, and, and frankly, a lot of profiling. Um, one of the more interesting conversations that I had years ago was uh, with um, a recruiter uh, at a very prominent VC, and um, he had a military background, and so they, he, he does a lot of profiling. And so I asked him, how do you know if somebody's an entrepreneur? And uh, he told me, um, I don't know, but I can tell you for a fact you are not it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and he, he, he went on to say, like, you have all these behaviors. Um, you have a high-risk-taking behavior, high-risk tolerance, uh, so on and so forth. And what he told me was, you're not an entrepreneur because you're too old. And I was in my 30s at the time. And the, re the reason he said I was too old was because he, the probability you start a company and you do it alone is very low. And then on top of that, um, the, it's so irrational to start a company that by the time you get older, you will not have friends that you can start a company with. Uh, and so either you need to find a way to make uh, much younger friends uh, or chances are you're, you're never gonna make it. And, and so that I think is, is sort of, that there is some reductive nature in that, in that field. Um. Do you mind if we get it? Um, can you just speak into the mic just so that we can get it and everybody can hear? Thanks, Han, for sharing your story. My name is Yura, studying economics, and I'm a huge fan of Netflix. So as an early stage engineer, how do you evaluate Netflix? And what was the most memorable projects that you worked in on? Um. So the question was, what was the most memorable project at Netflix, or? Uh, I had two questions. Uh -huh. First, how do you evaluate Netflix? And how do I develop what? Evaluate. Evaluate? Oh, the company? Oh, okay. Okay. And the second question was? The most memorable projects. Uh, at Netflix? You, yeah, at Netflix. Okay, so first of all, if you ever have a chance to work in Netflix, you should totally do it. Um, I think a lot of people work at Netflix and they, they join another company and they can't function anywhere else and they go back to Netflix. And so if you, if you look at people's LinkedIn, you, you see this. And it's, um, it is a, uh, an extremely um, like intense environment. You're around really, really smart people. Um, I think Reed Hastings is an extraordinary uh, CEO. Um, so, and, but at the same time, they, they have this like crazy Netflix culture, which you, you should read about if you haven't, um, that is all about freedom and responsibility. They, they will liter literally give you, um, uh, hold you completely accountable, uh, but give you extraordinary amount of control in whatever, whatever you do. Um, so uh, definitely give it a shot um, if you have or have a chance. Uh, the, the best project that we worked on at Netflix ended up being a bit of a passion project, which was the, um, which ended up being the, the video player uh, in the Netflix app. And the, the thing with the Netflix video player is um, if, you, if you pull out your phone, if you folks uh, have used Netflix or uh, watch Netflix, if you pull out the phone and you pull the video player out, um, I would encourage you to try to scrub uh, by taking the, the little nub and then try to search for the scene that you want. And what you'll see is that um, there's a little window that pops up and you see a mini picture of the scene. And as you like move your finger back and forth, um, the scene is like scrubbing seemingly at the same speed at the, as your finger moving. And like no other player does this. Um, and if they do, they copied us. If the, the, <laughs> But, what, but we did this uh, you know, 10 years ago, and it, it still works like this today. And the hack, and this is the beauty of it, and this is what, what makes me super happy about computer science and just building things that work beautifully, is um, while the video stream starts, um, the, the company has also stitched uh, at like one second intervals, um, the scenes of all the movies, and then stitched it into like a massive JPEG 
and it is downloading the movie along with this massive JPEG at the same time. And so that's why you don't need to buffer the whole movie uh, because there's a huge JPEG that already has the clips, but it gives the user the appearance that um, the person is able to jump to exactly the right scene. Um, and that, that's, that's like a, a very, very functional uh, feature that you know, hopefully delights users. Um, but it, it required an extraordinary amount of thinking, both from a design perspective as well as an engineering perspective. Hey, um, my name is Linus. I'm studying CS undergrad. Um, Netflix is, at least today, I don't know if it was like this when you were there, well known for uh, hiring almost exclusively senior engineers and not fresh out of college. Um, and uh, kind of being in the position of like having to uh, work with slash manage junior engineers and also having talked to some senior engineers, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the differences in managing those different types of engineers with experience and without experience differently. What, what, are, um, yeah, what are the differences in being able to manage them well? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very different experience. I, I think if uh, it's, in fact, I think the skills are very, very different. Um, when you manage junior engineers, you, you really have to surround that, the, the junior engineers with a strong team, and then the, the manager itself has to be, have the capacity to mentor. Um, managing senior engineers is radically different because um, as uh, engineers evolve over time, um, engineers themselves develop, or they, they have a different like phenotypes, so to speak. There's the hacker type of engineer, there's a very disciplined type of engineer, there's an architect engineer, and um, understanding how the engineers tick is, is becomes extremely critical. And, and part of it is because, um, for the most part, once you enter industry, uh, you're asked to do something. Um, they, the management team will always ask you for an estimate. Like, how long will it take for you to build this or solve, fix this bug or do this? Um, and the irony is that this is the same as asking you, oh, I'm gonna start on the CS project tonight. Um, you have no idea when it's gonna get done. You, you pray that it's gonna get done before you submit it, but you just don't know. And it, 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 that's the nature of puzzles, right? And, and most, um, if you're, as engineers, we solve puzzles, um, but we're always asked to estimate our puzzles. In order to manage um, senior software engineers, you have to really get uh, intimately intimate with their strengths and weaknesses, give them something that you think they can solve, they will give you a prediction of what they can do, but you also have to become very good at predicting what they can do. And so um, the level of intimacy that you develop uh, with that engineer becomes, um, it, it becomes much more te technical in nature. Whereas um, with the, the junior software engineers, you're actually trying to build them up from a, from a mentoring capacity. business admin major and I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your experiences um, so going back to your transformation of five thousand to fifty thousand um, dollars did you buy on margin that's my first question and second um, did you experience losses before you experienced gains I did um, but uh, as extraordinary as that story is um, it was I think in hindsight, it was mathematically the bottom of the crisis. And so like, it did, I, I think it didn't matter what I bought. <laughs> but all of those things happened, um, and it was just an incredible run. Um, I think that my, my point of that story was that uh, I think sometimes you have to hold a certain convictions to be true. And because I, I really wanted to continue to work on problems at scale, um, I was willing to you know, take a lot of risk uh, in order to do that. And I, I think I was comfortable with that decision because ultimately I was happy. Hi, Alan. Thanks for taking my question. Um, looking at the online freelancing space from a high level, could you comment on your thought process on where it's heading in the future given that uh, most people will be working in the gig economy 
part-time, and there seems to be a shift from full-time permanent work to more temporary work. And if you were to start a new company in the freelancing space today, what is a problem that uh, isn't being solved or uh, a market niche that isn't being properly, I guess, uh, facilitated by Upwork or other uh, leaders in the space like Fiverr? So there's a lot packed in there. Um, maybe I'll start at a high level. Uh, the contingent labor market uh, in the United States alone um, is, is fat quickly approaching a trillion dollars. Um, and contingent labor includes um, uh, all of the people that you see um, you know, driving cars, Uber or Lyft, includes local staffing, um, and it is a massive, massive market. Um, and part of the reason that this is happening is because globally, including in the United States, there is a trend of uh, both temporary employment, as you talk about, as well as underemployment, and that those trends do not appear to be abating. Um, and then moreover, uh, millennials um, and Gen Z, there, there is a more of an openness to, to, um, to freelancing in general um, and, and solopreneurship. And so these macro trends um, are all directional. Um, that being said, I think when, you, when, when we talk about uh, sort of the future of work, so to speak, um, I would argue that the industry uh, to date is still very much so uh, at day one. And the reason I say it is at day one is because the internet has pretty much disrupted everything that I can think of personally, except for this. Uh, the internet has disrupted how we consume premium video, um, like companies like Netflix, Hulu, so on and so forth. The internet has disrupted how we buy things. Um, Amazon has made huge disruptions and dislocations in the market. Um, Amazon has disrupted groceries. Um, food deliveries have been disrupted. Um, Everything that you can possibly think of seemingly has been disrupted by the internet. Like even getting a hotel, um, Airbnb, these are all revolutionary uh, solutions that have solved real problems, but the bulk of uh, staffing and labor is still a very, very manual process. So there's a lot of temporary labor. You still go to the manpower as the robber halves of the world. Um, and uh, there has yet to be a player that has really disrupted this you know, several hundred million dollar industry. I think uh, if one to emer were to emerge, they would probably need to come from, um, they, they would have to be a platform, they would need to be at internet scale, they would need to be a marketplace. I think those are the initial conditions. They probably need to start from a category that they can grow in concentric circles um, that is quite profitable. Um, some of those conditions uh, exist at Upwork. Upwork is already at very high scale. Um, one of our strongest com uh, categories is web development, um, which also has very high hourly rates. Um, but uh, the, the long-term solution probably involves uh, going after things like local staffing, and then you, you really need to build the full suite of tools. You need to be able to provide uh, freelancers with the ability to um, build people, uh, bill they need to be able to um, manage their freelancing life in some capacity. There needs to be solutions for accounting, tax, um, healthcare. Um, we, I think the industry itself needs to get much more sophisticated about uh, matching. Um, and so those are, those are sort of the many problems that exist out there. Um, I, I think Upwork has a great shot at this um, because I, we are the leader. Um, but we are in those early days where uh, when I sell candidates on the company, I tell them that in a lot of ways we, we have a marketplace um, much more similar to Craigslist than a, a specialized marketplace like an Airbnb. Um, and so whether or not we end up being a pioneer in this space is still TBD. It's uh, unclear if we're, um, you know, AltaVista, Yahoo, or we're the Google. Uh, it's unclear to me whether or not we're Friendster, Six Degrees of Freedom, MySpace, or we ultimately become Facebook. Um, but I think regardless, there, there is a mega, mega business in this space for sure. 
I want to make sure that we leave time for people to come talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. It's been really interesting. You all have had really, really good questions. I hope you'll take the time also to ask Han one-on-one. -on -one. One. We'll probably head out around 8.05. Um, but uh, thank you, and thank you very much, Han. Don't go anywhere.